All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Bible study tonight. I hope you can just uh, let me know when you jump on tonight. Uh, I think uh, we might not have quite as many as we have had been as we have been having on tonight. It was just a really nice day outside today, and so I'd like to just kind of know who's here and who all's watching tonight as we kind of get started. Um, when a few more people are on, I'll, I'll give some updates after a while, probably towards the end of the study, about uh, how uh, just some updates in and around Redeemer and how some things are going to work for Easter and the future of this study uh, here uh, on Monday nights and uh, what, we're, what we're moving into next. Because this is the last week. This is the last week of the study connected to Christ. I also want to just, uh, there's, there's a few on now, so for those of you who are here, I just want to kind of give a give a little bit of a disclaimer that um, yeah, this is the last week of Connected to Christ, um, Overcoming Isolation Through Community. Just a little bit of a disclaimer that I don't have any of the, the sort of polished uh, banners and overlays that I sometimes do. Um, so instead, tonight, we're just kind of kind of be chatting back and forth. I think it might be a little bit shorter of a study. I guess we will see how that goes. But thanks for telling me that you're here. Hi, Linda. Hi, Marilyn. Um, hi, Anne. Glad that some of you are here with us tonight. Uh, if you are planning to join us, planning to stay for the Bible study, just let me know that you're here. Hey, hey, Haldeman's glad you're with us as well, because uh, it does help me kind of know who all's watching, especially as I kind of plan. So now that there's there are several people on, I can kind of tell you um, I'm I'm sort of trying to gauge how many people we are continuing to have in this Bible study as compared to the the Sunday morning one. How many of you guys have started to return to church and maybe don't need the Monday night? Is is this Monday night just because the time works well for you, or and, and you're doing other things on Sunday morning, or is it because of, of other things? So just tell me who's here. That that way I at least know who I can kind of reach out to. Um, uh, to know how things are doing. So we've got Linda Barr, Marilyn, Marilyn. We've got two Lindas and two Marilyns. That's that's just so when I say Linda and when I say Marilyn, you guys are always you guys are always probably going, who's he even talking about? So anyways, glad you guys are here. I thought my wife Jennifer was going to be joining online, but I also might have a little bit less stable connection. So that's where we're at tonight. I don't have polished overlays. We're just going to be chatting through the outline. I'll put the outline up. I might get a Bible verse up there or so, but that's kind of going to be the plan tonight for this last week. How have you guys been doing? What have you been up to um, today? Because uh, I've been doing yard work all day. So if I'm just seeming a little bit tired, I, I took a shower. Today is the one week that I thought maybe because it's Holy Week. Happy Holy Week, everybody, by the way. Um, because it's Holy Week, um, I didn't know if I would be able to get any other time off the rest of the week. And it's so nice outside. We did landscaping around our mailbox. And I'm telling you this because it has nothing to do with anything we're talking about in Bible study. But um, I was outside working all day. And so I'm just kind of ready for, I don't know, a laid back Bible study tonight. And I don't know how you can do that when I'm the only one talking the whole time. But anyways, uh, we're going to just try to relax this evening. Thank you so much, every one of you, for being here tonight. Barb says two hours is too much for Remy on Sunday morning, so ho hopefully soon. Okay, glad to know. I noticed that you guys were back here online, Costellos, um, as, opposed to, as opposed to in church, so I get that. Uh, Marilyn says all the cool people named Marilyn and Linda are on here. Good Dakey's glad that you're with us here. You were doing yard work, Anne, and granddaughters are here all weekend. What a joy. Glad you're getting to see them this weekend. Okay. Well, it looks kind of like I have our typical group here, and that's that's kind of at this point who I'm excited to see every week as those of you who are joining us. Um Give me feedback just, you know, throughout the study uh, if, if, if you can't hear something or can't see something. So connected to Christ, overcoming isolation through community. As you know, this is this is week six of this study. So let's just open with our word of prayer today. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you guided and blessed the, the, the holy families of old by your word and spirit. We thank you for guiding us, your church, to be together. Remind us of the, the unity that you have given in Christ Jesus. Help us to know and appreciate one another and strengthen us, strengthen among us the, the bonds of love and care that we may encourage, comfort, and support one another in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I have a hymn here, and uh, we sang this, I believe, in Nixa on this past Sunday. And I don't know that I'm going to take the time to sing it all tonight, but I'd like to to at least have you read through the verses of this hymn, uh, because each verse kind of hits at something different that's all connected to community. So I think pondering these verses as just an, an introduction to our study tonight is going to be helpful. So um, 
What is the first verse of this hymn commend us to do? And maybe I'll just put that out there as a question. Read through, read through the first verse of this hymn. I think I've got the whole thing up here on the screen, all, all, all three lines of it. It's a pretty short hymn. Uh, we sang it in Nixon this past Sunday. What does the first verse of this hymn commend us to do? Lord, help us walk your servant way wherever love may lead and bending low, forgetting self, each serve the other's need. Hey, Bruce, Joanne, glad you're with us tonight as well. As you can see, the first verse of this hymn just sort of starts out with the bang of saying, we're going to follow in Jesus' footsteps. We're going to serve like he served. We're going to meet the needs of others. We're going to talk more about serving others a lot tonight. It's one of the three essential practices for building community that, that Davies in his book that we've been walking through talks about. Uh, he says there's three essential practices. We talked about worship being one of those last week. Serving others is the third of those as well. Um, then it talks, then the hymn, if you go to verse two, um, according to verse two, whose example do we follow? So we're going to serve others. And who is this that's told us to serve others? It's, it says, you came to earth, O Christ, as Lord, but power you laid aside. You lived your years in servanthood. In lowliness, you died. So that's just kind of a reminder that uh, when we follow a servant path, when when we decide to humble ourselves and serve someone else instead, we are indeed following in the footsteps of Jesus. Um, then it continues with verse three. Uh, it says, "No golden scepter, but a towel you place within the hands of those who seek to follow you and live by your commands." Now. I found that, that word towel really interesting. What's the towel in verse 3 a reference to? There might be multiple answers to this. Uh, the first thing that I thought of whenever I read that word towel, you can tell me if you thought of something else. Hey, Woody, Marsha, glad you're with us tonight. Uh, it's good to see you even here. Jennifer's here as well. Good. Glad everybody's now kind of here as we're walking through the hymn. We're in verse 3 of this hymn. And it mentions a towel. It says, no golden scepter but a towel you place within the hand. So in other words, Jesus doesn't come to give you a golden scepter to make you king of something. Instead, he hands you a towel, right? A towel is, is the cloth of a servant person. And if we think about a biblical story, we might even envision uh, Jesus here during this most holy week on Maundy Thursday in the upper room with his disciples when he did foot washing. He washed the feet of his disciples. And so he then hands the towel off to you now that you've washed feet. Thank you, Barb. Washing the feet of the disciples. That's the first thing that came to my mind as well. So um, that's the story in my mind. And I think perhaps just a, a towel is just a symbol of servanthood, right? You the parents wipe off their children after a bath and so forth as they serve them and take care of them. Um, we use towels and rags to clean things. And so maybe maybe a rag, although maybe it wouldn't quit, um, fit in here, you know, no golden scepter, but a rag you place within the hands. Maybe that'd be, uh, that, that, that works okay. You know, maybe that'd be an even uh, starker contrast to say what type of what type of leadership Jesus comes to bring. He doesn't come to, to give us power and might, even though he has all of the power and might in the world possibly to give. Instead, he gives a towel. And then finally, verse four, well, I guess there's two verses left, but the last verse is actually just a repeat of the first verse, which is all just what the hymn is about. Uh, verse four says, you bid us bend our human pride, nor count ourselves above the lowest place, the meanest task, the weights that weights the gift. Of love. So verse four again calls us to place ourselves last. Jesus has this recurring theme that I think once you've understood that, uh, you, you've you understood the message of Christianity. And yet at the same time, um, um, it's one of the deepest and yet most simple phrases in all of scripture. I don't know how better to say that. Uh, Jesus says continually, uh, the first will be last and the last will be first. And uh, here, uh, you're not called to, you don't get to be first by, by having power and might, by holding a scepter. Instead, you are to seek the, the meager task, the lowly, the humble task. And that's what we do in Christian servanthood and service to others around us. So uh, that's our hymn for this evening. Uh, thanks for, for sticking with me throughout the hymn. I'd like to move on to Davy's book and his text. Um, so I hope that you guys have kind of been reading along because I, I, I hope that what I talk about on 
Sunday mornings or Monday evenings makes more sense if you've actually done the reading. And I know some of you did order those books and pick them up from church offices. So um, Davies discusses the importance of Christian relationships in this chapter. So we're in chapter four, uh, the second half of chapter four. And he labels them as the second essential practice of Christian community. Remember, we've been talking this whole time about Christian community and how community is the answer to feeling isolated and alone, and, 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 and Christian community is just something that this world needs so badly right now because we're so segmented, we're so divided, we're so polarized, we have opposite opinions. We've talked about all of those things, right? And now he says, okay, so Christians are called together. Uh, he lays down the biblical groundwork for Christian community and says community is how God's called his people to live. Now in this last chapter, he gives us essential practices. So how do we build this community? What are we supposed to do together? Last week, the first essential practice was worship. We spoke about how worship draws us together. It's kind of the center or the heart of everything we do. Today, we get the other two essential practices. I think I'm being told my connection's unstable. So sorry if you guys can't hear me, but I'm going to just keep going. The second essential practice after worship, so worship's at the heart, worship is the center and focus and draws us together in community. The next thing, can you guys still hear me? Put up a post just to kind of reassure me in a few minutes that, uh, or in, in, in 20 seconds or so after you type it up that you can still hear me. Um, hopefully it's not cutting out. Um, the second essential practice is Christian relationships, he says. He says, uh, Jesus built relationships with his disciples. When he called the first disciples out, um, okay, good, thanks, Anne, that you can hear me. He discusses how, Davies discusses how Jesus not only had 12 disciples, but he also had three who were closer to him, who he dedicated extra and special time to, this inner circle of Peter, James, and John. Then I ask the question, and he kind of ponders this question as well. How has having deep meaningful, intentional relationships with other Christians been of benefit to you in your life? And this is certainly a question that I would take your input on. Uh, where, you know, do you have Christian relationships, intentional Christian relationships that, that you have fostered? Maybe, you know, maybe people you're like, hey, I just like hanging out with that person, but they are a Christian. And, and, you know, maybe there's that person in your life that you know you can go to and talk to. I know um, um, Mark, um, Mark Costello has mentioned to me that he's got he's got a pastor friend that I think he calls and talks to regularly, and I know that that person serves. Um, and I don't mean to share things that that he doesn't want me to share, but I know he's shared it in Bible study before, um, even on even on, on Sunday mornings that that he talks to. Right, I've got a pastor friend. Right, it's kind of nice to to have friends even around the country, right, who I can kind of bounce ideas off of as pastors and who can encourage me and, and kind of call me out when I'm, when I'm being bullheaded or doing something that, that doesn't make sense for a Christian to be doing. And at the same time, who can encourage me when I'm having kind of a down day and just be like, oh, man, uh, I don't know if I'm cut out for any of this, right? We all have kind of those doubts about like, what am I doing here? Is this even all you know, making sense? And just someone to be an encouragement, right? So I've, I've experienced the joy and the value of having someone that I can both talk to and, and, and confess my sins to uh, because they are a brother pastor. But more than that, so it's not just about having a pastor, it's also about having friends and relationships, having somebody to talk to about what you think about Christ, what you think about life, uh, how you view the world, someone that you know you can talk to. And they're not going to just immediately say, oh, you're just one of those crazy Christians. And they're not just going to put you in some kind of camp immediately. They're going to treat you as a person. This type of deep, meaningful relationship is what we're talking about here. Um, Barb or Mark, and it might be, it might be Mark talking, says, I can trust them to listen without judgment, but also keep me accountable when I'm wrong about something. That's exactly right. This is the type of person. So, so how, how has it helped you? Um, how has, has having those deep, meaningful, intentional relationships with other Christians been of benefit to you in your life? Or have they been? I think we're kind of assuming that that having meaningful relationships with other Christians is important to Christians. I would say you, you're going to be struggling as a Christian if you don't have any meaningful, intentional Christian relationships. And maybe we could even add to that, has that been a hard thing or an easy thing for you to actually develop? Okay, Barb, sorry, I didn't know it was you instead of Mark. But yes, you're exactly right. Um, um, Someone who's there to tell you when you're wrong about something and someone who's there to encourage you uh, when you're not, uh, you know, and and just tell you that you're still loved, right? Um, Anne says that they keep her grounded and on the proper 
intentional path that I desire, right? So, so good. I'm glad. And, you know, obviously you don't have to share who these people are for you, but, um, you know, I'm glad that, that you guys do, uh, by and large. And I think most people who are joining this Bible study are, um, seasoned Christians, I would say, you know, people who have been in and around the church or at least a part of this Bible study for quite some time. And so, uh, having these relationships is just exponentially valuable. Okay. That's kind of the point of this first question. We can move on to talk about the next, um, the next thing. Um, and this is kind of an interesting topic. This is kind of what we talked about for a long time in Bible study yesterday morning. Davies mentions that, that forming this type of relationship seems to come easier for women than for men. Now, a lot of you on here watching are women, but I think there are some men watching as well. Um, he says he almost hesitates to, to say, to label them as Christian relationships because he says relationships has become this, this somewhat feminized word. Now, I don't know if, if that's, I don't know how much I agree with Davies on this point. I don't know that it's necessarily harder for men to develop close intentional relationships than it is for women. I just think that those relationships operate and function differently. But I'd, I'd be open to hearing what you guys have to say. I don't want to get crazy political thing or, or anything on here. I guess we are on a, on a public space still theoretically. Yesterday in Bible study, we got a little bit, you know, talking just about the differences between men and women. And certainly we want to uphold those, but not, not try to put man or woman above one another, but instead recognize that there are certainly distinctions and differences in the way that God has created and wired men to operate and women to operate. Some of the, some of the comments that came up yesterday, and I don't know that I'm necessarily endorsing or opposing these, these, these thoughts, but 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 people said things like, you know, women women seem to be somewhat soft in their relationships. They want to talk about some of that gushy stuff a little bit faster, um, or at least um, they're willing to. Uh, men sometimes want to put on a certain face or front. But then there's also kind of the flip side of that, that's, and, and, and so men are kind of hard in some ways. Um, and so it's harder to have those sort of relationship type 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 stuff with them. But at the same time, I think sometimes sometimes women can, and, and this is a man talking, so I don't know. Maybe I'm completely wrong. That's why I phrased the question the way I did. Is it, you know, if you're a woman, do you think it's challenging for you? Or is it easy for you? If you're a man, do you think it's challenging for you? Do you think it's easy for you? And I'm kind of talking now. I've seen that, that some of you are putting up comments, and then I'll kind of read those in just a minute. Um, but at the same time, I think we can all sort of put up a front sometimes that isn't who we truly are, and it can take some time to develop a relationship with someone. Um, and, uh, guys, especially, you know, we don't just immediately walk up to another guy and start sharing our life story. Uh, but some guys do, but most don't. So I don't know. What are your thoughts as a man or as a woman? Do you kind of agree with Davy's point on this, that like building relationships can be easier for women and harder for men? Or would you kind of disagree based on even your own experience in life? Um, Jennifer says, I would think it's more of an introvert extrovert than a male female difference. I think that's probably true. Um, um, I think that 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 his point is somewhat less about maybe how hard and easy. And maybe I I said it wrong. I don't know. I I don't have the book in front of me to read exactly what he says. I think some of his point is just that that women seem to just enjoy those sort of chatty circles together. I use the example even in our own church body. Right? We have large or organization. Uh, for the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, this great group of Lutheran women, you know, built around this idea of community and coming together and potlucks and talking to each other and just kind of chit-chatting all the time. We don't have a, that type of group for, by and large, for for men. There there was a there was a men's network uh, that sort of formed Lutheran Hour Ministries, uh, but those those have been far less successful in sort of just coming together continually. Now, I will say Redeemer, specifically Redeemer Nixa, is a little bit opposite of this. It's kind of interesting. We do have a few ladies groups, a few LWML groups. So if you're interested in those, I can tell you more about them. Maybe you're already involved with them. But but we have some men's Bible studies um, that are just filled, I mean, with people. Uh, we have a Friday morning men's Bible study that I think this past Friday uh, Paul Peckman leads that study as well, but there's a lot of people at it. I think he said there was 17 guys at that study uh, this past Friday. There's an adult. I mean, there's a there's a early morning men's Bible study. That study is not full by any means, but there's that's a group of of about six men from in and around the community conversation that have a Bible study together. Um, there's also there's also um, 
let's see, I, I guess those are all the just men Bible studies. But then our 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 aim Bible study that happens on Thursday is about as many men as women. Um, and so the you know that's that's sort of the couples Bible study. And so we have some groups of men that actually get together. We don't have a young men's group that kind of gets together. That's kind of people my age. So um, uh, we'll we'll work on that. I'm I'm chatting with a few of them to get some families uh, together, maybe in a park, to start some of that. Um, Anne says that she agrees as well with Jennifer. Barb says, I agree that there are big differences. I assume that means between men and women. I do remember, though, that my dad, um, being a widower for 14 years after my mom passes, those were very lonely years for him. Yeah, so maybe that that does that does indicate kind of what Davey's talking about here. And, you know, it's just hard uh, for men sometimes to to go out there and build a relationship, especially uh, if maybe his wife, I don't know your family, Barb, or your parents, but maybe his wife was more of the social one who kind of oversaw their social engagements together. And so that was challenging. Bruce, Bruce had a comment. He said, I think while we are working, we tend to identify closely with our vocation. For men, these are sometimes tough guy jobs, and it's more difficult to let our guard down. I think that probably describes things pretty well. Uh, I truly and firmly believe that God has wired men and women differently. And one of the ways that I see that in scripture is all the way back at the beginning, right? In Genesis, uh, obviously, of course, we have the creation narrative where God makes man and then he makes woman. And obviously he forms their bodies in different ways. He creates Eve to be a helper suitable to fit the needs of Adam. Um, and yet he, he gives each of them responsibilities. And, and um, what's, what's particularly interesting to me um, is, is how in the garden, when Adam and Eve sin, okay, so they fall away, they break God's command, and they mess up the world for forever, and we can blame Adam and Eve for, for it, but know that we would have done the same thing. Then God gives curses. God gives curses to Adam and Eve. Um, Oh, 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 Romeo, that's that's also a men's group. Thank you, Barb. Romeo is um, retired old men eating out. They get together once a month. I think it's the last Friday of the month. They just started again. I think they meet at Jimmy's Egg, and uh, it's retired old men eating out, and uh, they just go out to eat. I don't think there's much Bible study or anything else involved, but they do talk uh, plenty, and I don't know how many are involved with that group. Uh, but uh, I think they meet at Jimmy's Egg on South Campbell, and it's every, I think it's the fourth Friday of the month, uh, and they just started meeting again here post-COVID, I think this past Friday. So that is what Romeo is. Fourth Friday. Thank you, Marilyn. So um, anyways, back to the Garden of Eden. Sorry, I'm kind of keeping your um, <laughs> retired old women eating out, Romeo. I don't know that that really works very well. <laughs> And anyways, um, but no, no, women, um, women need, need to get together in chat too. So uh, certainly ladies, if you want to form some kind of a group that does either just a conversation or, or Bible study, any of that would be great. Okay. Let me get back to the garden of Eden. God gave specific curses uh, to Adam that he gave to eat. So um, to Adam, he says, the ground is going to be hard. So your vocation of working and tilling the ground, kind of like Bruce was talking about a second ago, right? That's going to be hard for you. Uh, but to the woman, he gave other challenges. He gave challenges in childbearing, in caring for the home, um, in, in, you know, when you give birth, it's going to be painful, he says. Now, these, these, these implications certainly have, have challenges for the spouse, too. So, like, when he gives Adam this curse on the ground, right, Adam's now going to have to work harder to, to till the ground, which means then uh, it's going to be harder than for Eve when she's helping him with that task as well, right? And, and he gave this curse to Eve, right, about the children, and they're going to run around, and they're going to misbehave, and that is, that's Eve's curse. And now that's going to have some implications for Adam, too, because it means when Adam tries to, you know, tell Cain to not kill Abel, there's going to be some problems there, too. Uh, you know, it, it's going to have problems that sort of crossbreed, but it's specifically first given to to their their first vocation of of working and and those types of those types of calling for the man for Adam and for Eve for the thing that she uniquely can do right she uniquely Adam cannot 
give birth, right? And care for her family in that nurturing type way. Women are nurturers. It's it's just bred in them. They are they are more readily able to do that. I don't think that's wrong in any way. They 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 are more prone towards it. Now I think it scales, you know, there's there's men that are really nurturing and caring, and there's women that 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 may or may not feel that way, right? And each relationship is different. Sometimes I think that I act like the woman in our relationships, and Jennifer acts more like the man sometimes. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong there. Uh, so these things do sometimes depend on each individual person, but there are tendencies towards some of these things. And uh, I don't think it's bad. We just have to, you know, recognize it's not a bad thing to pause sometimes as Davies does and just say, hey, by the way, building relationships is going to look different for every person. And it's going to probably look a little bit different for men than it does for women. Different types of things are going to be appealing. Uh, maybe a fishing trip is going to look appealing to men. And women are going to say, I don't know that I care about that. There might be some women who would enjoy it, right? But but these are helpful distinctions to make to just recognize, that, hey, um, and, and somebody, I think Gary Starkle shared yesterday, he's joined us on here before, he shared yesterday, you know, he's got a couple that, that he and Mary hang out with and he can go talk to them about things. He said, there are certain types of things that when I really, when I really want to talk about how I feel about something, I'll go to her instead of to him because he'll probably just be trying to fix it. I'm, I'm reminded of a friend of my in-laws, a couple friend um, that we were talking at an event a couple of years now. It's been like 10 years ago. And, uh, and, and the guy was like, you know, she, she comes to me and when she starts telling me about whatever issue she has and whatever's going through her mind, I have to say, wait, pause, pause. Tell me, is this something you want me to fix? Or is this just something you want me to listen to? Because men and women are operated, are, are wired differently. And so the man wants to just come in and fix the problem. Whereas the woman might just want to chat. She might just want to tell you what's going on. Now, again, those are some generalizations. But uh, they do tend to be true in many men and many women. And uh, it helps to know about these things when we're talking about building relationships together, even within the church. So we, it might be okay to have a men's group that does certain things and a, and a women's group that does certain other things. Uh, some of those things may not appeal uh, to the other gender. We are made distinctively different. Davies mentions that Jesus even sends out his disciples on mission in twos. And that this most likely developed and deepened the relationships between those two disciples more deeply. Okay, that was redundant. I'm sorry. You know, you can blame the guy who wrote the study. Oh, yeah, that was that was me. What practices could we intentionally develop to foster deeper Christian relationships? How have you experienced iron sharpening iron in your Christian walk? If you guys have ideas, um, um, <laughs> um, yeah, Jennifer says that that distinction between do you want to actually, like, do you want me to fix this or do you want me to um, just uh, talk, let you talk about this as a helpful distinction when you're sort of venting frustrations? I understand. And sometimes I have those times that I'm like, you know what? I don't need you to fix it. I just want to tell you about what's going on. So I don't know if that's always a man-woman thing, but I think it, it tends to be that way. Um, so think maybe just for a moment, we're quite a ways in the Bible study now, so we're not going to spend long on this, but what practices could you intentionally develop to foster deeper Christian relationships? And, you know, think about this idea of iron sharpening iron. This is a scriptural reference that Davies mentions uh, in your Christian walk. What are those things that you can do to kind of foster this intentional practice to develop community even in your own life? Uh, what are some things? Maybe, maybe is there a group that you could actually try to join. Uh, maybe maybe you've tried it before and it didn't go well, but maybe I can go to it again. Uh, maybe it's changed now. Maybe it's different. I know, I don't know if, you know, how many of you are actually going to events and going to in-person things, but uh, as we begin to to be more comfortable going to those things, you know, maybe, maybe now is a good time to develop some intentional relationships. Maybe there's just somebody you should call who you're like, you know, I used to chat with this person all the time. It was kind of helpful for me to, to, to talk with them. I haven't talked to them in a while. Uh, let's see if we can maybe grab coffee once a month or once a week, whatever whatever your schedule might allow. So what are some practices? That's kind of this last question. What are some practices? Uh, you know, whether or not do you need to pursue more or an increased depth in your own Christian relationships? You could write a few steps down on a piece of paper or just, just think right now, what are some steps that I could take uh, to develop a deeper Christian relationship 
with a specific person or do I need more of that right now? Or maybe I'm feeling overwhelmed. I've had portions of my life, short little bits that I'm like, you know what? I've got so much community trying to help right now. When I first moved here, and this is not a bad thing. This was an amazing thing. When I first moved here to Reamer, I had so many people that just wanted to be of help and support. I, for a very brief moment, had just almost this relationship overkill that was just like, I'm meeting so many new people. I've got so many people that are offering to help in so many different ways. I just can't take it. Like I want to be left alone. Like I want to not have somebody knock on my door for the next like just two days <laughs> because we are, there were that many people coming. And that was awesome. That just showed what a friendly community we have here at Redeemer. So it was great. But but maybe you are looking around and saying, you know what, I've I've got plenty of this and I'm doing good, but, but maybe what can I do to develop so, certain ones of those relationships a little bit deeper? Jesus pulled out three, just three people and said, hey, you come to the transfiguration with me. Hey, you come when I heal and raise the little girl from the dead, right? There's, there's these events that he says, hey, these three, you come with me. The other disciples don't have to be there for all of that, right? So he was intentional about saying, hey, I'm going to develop a deeper relationship with these few disciples with these few people. So who are the people that you'd like to develop a deeper relationship with? These are things just to think about, not necessarily for you to have to, to tell me about. Um, Barb says, I think our church small groups can be very helpful. Yes, thank you so much, Barb, for, for starting one of those. You and Mark and Jim and Janet Crawford and a few others met for the first time again this past Thursday. So uh, glad you guys are doing that. And there are some small groups that are very active up, up, up and around our Springfield campus that, that yes, this is small groups are are all about this, developing this, these these deeper, more meaningful um, things. So we should certainly develop that. Normally during this Lenten series, this Lenten time is when we really have an emphasis on, on small groups. I'm sure we'll do that once again for sure next year. But anybody that has questions about small groups, if you'd like to join one, if you are you know have questions about are there any that might work well for me, uh, just come and talk to me. You know, we could put up lots of lists of those things, but then they're always outdated. Best thing to do is just, just talk to somebody um, and get a feel for, for whether or not there's something that you could become involved with there. Marilyn says, I think that when we serve others together, strong relationships are built. Thank you. That's, that's like the segue into the next topic. That's the third practice of Christian community. So thanks for giving me the segue. Yes, and I think it's important for our small groups to do service projects together. Amen. Okay, you guys have like passed the last part of the study. Uh, serving together is the essential practice number three. Uh, Marilyn, Barb, you were telling me, okay, pastor, be quiet. Let's move on to the next topic and get out of here early tonight. So in Matthew 14, 13 to 21, Jesus utilizes his disciples to feed hungry crowds. So this is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And Davies points out that he doesn't just feed them and he doesn't just take them out. He tells his disciples, you give them something to eat. And they say, what? 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 How? Huh? How am I supposed to do that? And they say, we just got five loaves and two fish. And so then Jesus works the miracle, of course. But he still has the disciples be the ones who take the food, take the goodness of Jesus out to all the people, right? Jesus is the one who, who gives the good stuff, makes lots of it. But the disciples are the ones who he says, you take and give them the money. You, you take it out. And they did. And then they collected the baskets full at the end of leftovers as well. So how do you think that the, the disciples reacted after seeing this done, even through their own hands? Do you think it had any greater impact on them? Um, the fact that they were the ones who were delivering this good, uh, this this food? Do you think it had any impact on them that, that it was using their hands to actually deliver this, this miracle, this food to the people who were hungry? Um, you know, does it change things for you when you are the one who's able to deliver some good thing to someone else? Um, that's, that's sort of the point that we're driving at. This is something a, a little bit different, but I know when I when I am able to do a baptism, I did a baptism this past Saturday, and especially when I reflect back on baptizing my own child, this is such an amazing gift that God gives, right? It's forgiveness, life, and salvation in and through this, this simple thing of water, right? It's amazing that, that God uses my hands to splash water up onto a child and do this, this, this or an adult too, and do this amazing thing, uh, and he's using my hands to do it. In a somewhat similar way, when we serve others, God is using our hands, our feet, 
our tools, our wood and nails, our, our bags to, you know, whatever it is, our goods to help someone else. We become the hands and feet of the disciples and the hands and feet of Jesus. I think the disciples may have been like, whoa, this is just crazy. Like they may have been leaving for joy. I don't know. Um, Marilyn says, I've often wondered what this looks like for the disciples. Did they have baskets that never grew empty? I don't know. Like, did they just keep pulling out of it? Or do they need to keep going back to Jesus being like, is there more? Is there more? Oh, yeah, we're going to fill up and there's more. I kind of keep just like, like imagining Jesus just continually breaking bread and then picking up another piece and breaking it. And then he, he just like, I don't know, it's not grew. It must have just like grown. I don't know if it was some kind of bread that just kind of grew bigger and fluffy and multiplied. I don't know, Marilyn. I'm with you. I'm not sure how this miracle worked. And like, they must have just been blown away that like, there's, there's still more. There's, there's still more. We got more people. Oh, look, there's, there's more here. Oh, we, oh, we got more. There's, there's more. It's just crazy. Like, I'm not sure how it all happened, but the fact here is that, that God used the disciples hands to actually make it all happen. He was not just taking care of it himself. He said, you give them something to he eat. Um, when have you, and this is kind of what Marilyn was pointing out, when have you experienced serving alongside others, bringing a deeper sense of community for you? Davies makes the claim that people who serve together experience a level of care for one another and a sense of living in and practicing community with one another that those who do not serve simply don't experience. So once again, people who serve together experience a level of care for one another and a sense of living in and practicing community with one another that those who, who don't serve simply do not experience. Um, when have you experienced that to be true? Is there a time, is there a servant event that you did, uh, something specific in your life that you're like, you know what, when I was getting to serve in this way alongside someone else, it really deepened my connection to that person or to that group. I know this is just so abundantly true for me. Um, it's just the way church ministry works. If I'm working with you, even if it's just on a committee, even if it's just on a team doing, doing, you know, menial tasks, whatever it is, these are the places when you can really develop relationships. We grew as a comfort dog team whenever we went up to serve at Convoy of Hope together. Um, we've grown in, in, in so many ways. This is honestly, I think, and, and we don't do right now, well, I don't know if there's many happening at all, you know, because of the global pandemic, but we don't do many uh, foreign mission trips. Uh, sometimes foreign mission trips, I think this is the better value of foreign mission trips um, or even local mission trips to your community. Some of the best value is not only in the fact that, that you're helping somebody else, like that's good and that's great. Um, a better thing about it, maybe, I don't know, at least the just as good thing about it is that you build community and relationships with those people that you are serving alongside. Crosslines does a great job of that. Marilyn mentioned that, uh, that, you know, this is just a great, they're, they've got a great system set up for being able to serve along other people and work with them and even, you know, be able to talk as you're just, you know, the week we were there, I was unpackaging juice boxes and then repackaging juice boxes um, and marking out the labels, right? Whatever it is that you're doing, right? If you're stuffing shelves, whatever, you know, maybe you're doing yard work together. These times are great times when you're working with your hands, you can talk to people. I worked out and I redid the garden bed or created a garden bed around our mailbox today. And I was able to have conversations with my wife that we've been needing to have for a long time, right? Because we were able to talk together because we were serving I mean, we were serving ourselves in a sense, so it's not quite, you know, community service, but we were working with our hands together. And when we work with our hands together to serve, to help someone else, we are serving together. And that builds a sense of community. When Anne says, when she was a Sunday school teacher, you loved it. Well, uh, we are looking for Sunday school teachers right now. I know you haven't returned to worship yet, but uh, we are we are needing those because we are getting Sunday school back up and started. So yes, serving alongside Sunday school teachers is great. And our neighbors were out and about too. We did. We got to develop relationships today with our neighbors because we were in our front yard working on our um, mailbox. And so we talked to them and actually they're helping me out and do something. I, one of my neighbors is, is taking my lawnmower to the shop for me because he was headed that way anyways. And I was like, that's awesome. Thank you so much. So it's a place in a way that we can help one another when we serve together. Very good. Um, the Redeemer Serves team was founded on the idea. Uh, this is this is the last kind of comment on my uh, little study guide here. 
was founded on the idea that service toward others is truly something that Christ has called us to do in his church, but also that it's beneficial for building us, for building us up the community of the saints. So for, for building up community in the congregation. Uh, next week, we are not going to have this study. It's Easter Sunday. We've got some special stuff happening at church in person. I'm going to go over a little bit of that in just a moment with you. The following week here in this study, we're going to continue um, a Bible study. But for a few weeks, we're going to focus on this idea of community service. So now you've kind of learned the, okay, why is this important? And we're going to spend three weeks, four weeks maybe even, talking about and, and planning a service project in the few weeks after Easter. Um, the, the, uh, the Missouri District is encouraging us to um, be visible in the community through a project called SHINE, a district-wide community service event that's going to happen later in April, and Redeemer wants to be a part of that. And one of the ways that we're going to be a part of it is by um, having this, this three-week Bible study, um, in a sense, that's leading up to and giving us the opportunity to plan some servant events. So uh, just maybe for now, uh, consider your neighbors, consider your community leaders, think about the less fortunate around us. How can we reach out to them? How could we be visible in serving in the community? Uh, we're going to plan some ways that, that at least a few of us can serve together, uh, maybe in some, in some small groups in the coming weeks. There's a curriculum that we're going to um, use for that uh, that's put out by, I, actually, I don't know who wrote it, but it's something that my church in Ozark uh, with Jim Bartok, who's joined me on this program once before, has has utilized. And uh, we're going to, hopefully, the plan and the goal, I'm not sure how it's going to work quite in an online setting like this, but the goal would be for throughout the process for us to gain some some knowledge about what we're good at and what we're maybe not good at. And so therefore ways that we can serve and then some needs that are around us that, that we might be able to meet and then uh, figure out a way to actually meet those needs um, and, and do it and then report back and kind of celebrate how, hey, I went and did this. Hey, I was able to get this done this week in serving the community in some way. And maybe it means just serving with your family. Uh, maybe that's the group that's going to have to serve together or maybe you'll be able to actually meet up with somebody else that's on this Bible study and we, uh, a few of you can plan together and say, hey, we're going to do this uh, during this, this Shine event week. So more on that coming. No Bible study next week. Think about community service opportunities, things, small projects you could do, but think big. If there's something bigger we could do, something we could put on and host, uh, certainly we can talk about those things too. But what are you good at? And we're going to talk all about that for the coming weeks. So don't worry too much about it now, but um, that's this was just a perfect segue into what our next whole study is going to be about. So if you're if you love community service, uh, keep keep joining us after Easter again. Two weeks next week we don't have study because it's Easter on Sunday morning, and I'm not going to be leading this on Easter Monday night. So uh, that's what's happening in two weeks. Next weekend we have Easter Sunday worship. Um, just a little bit about that. I think I might have a banner still. Oh, but it doesn't have the. This this little scrolling banner does not have, okay, you can probably, I'll just take this one down because that's actually inaccurate. Um, there's no Saturday night service next Saturday for Holy Saturday. Uh, there is worship on Thursday night at 6.30. On, that has the cantata at the end of it, which is a beautiful service of darkness that, our, that some members from our choir have put together that they're going to sing for us on Thursday evening in Nixa. Uh, Thursday, there will be worship in Springfield, uh, but it's not the cantata. Instead, on Friday, there's worship in Nixa, regular worship. It'll be a service of darkness. It'll be a Good Friday service. But in Springfield, they will have the cantata. So if you'd like to go to the cantata, you can either go Thursday in Nixa at 630 or Friday in Springfield at 630. Um, you can go to that service as well. Then Saturday, there's no worship in Nixa like usual. And instead, there is a Easter vigil on Saturday night at 730 in Springfield. Springfield only. So no Nixa Saturday night worship on Saturday of Easter. But yes, in Springfield at 7.30, it's an Easter vigil. Okay, then Sunday morning. Some of you I know have not come back. To, and we're going to live stream uh, as much of that as we can. We still don't know if we can live stream the cantata or not, if we have permission and rights to do so. But we're going to try to. I don't know how the sound quality is going to be. It may not be great, but we're going to try. Okay, then. I know some of you haven't come back to worship yet, and I know some of you are you know, trying to come to the services that are least well attended so that there can be fewer people, and I get that, especially on Easter. So if you're thinking about coming back to worship on Easter, but you want a smaller 
attended worship service, you are probably going to need to come to one of our sunrise services at 6.30. I know that's super early in the morning, and I know you're not used to getting up early for church at all anymore because maybe you've been worshiping online. But uh, if you want to come to a less well-attended worship service, I think you should come to Easter sunrise service. I don't think we're going to have a lot of people for it, but it is an extra worship opportunity. It's going to be the same basic worship service as we're doing at the later services with a few modifications, a little less special music, and maybe if the weather's nice, even starting the service outside, um, even at both of the campuses. So uh, it'll be a really special worship service, and we hope that you can join us for that at the sunrise service. Or if you're planning to come to regular Sunday worship, we have them, of course, at Sunday worship for Easter. We have them, of course, at 8 a.m. and at 1045 at both our campuses like normal. We're going to have overflow seating available at both places in case our sanctuaries get very, very full. And we need to ask people to sit out and, and watch the service as it happens you know, simultaneously simulcast on the screens out in our fellowship hall. So that's the plan for Easter. You don't have to register for worship, uh, but uh, it, it, I, I do anticipate, especially based on the Palm Sunday worship attendance that we just had, which was excellent and great, but especially in Nixa, I do anticipate that there will be quite a few people returning to worship in our sanctuaries. We're going to try to keep people somewhat spaced out, and we are requiring masks still during Easter for sure. Um, but I can't promise you that you're not going to be close to somebody else on Easter. Unless you come to that early morning service, I think you're going to be very, very comfortable and safe with a smaller number of people at that service. Um, but that's kind of the lay of the land for Easter. Uh, we're going to have in between the 8 and 1045 services, we're going to have all kinds of stuff happening. There's an Easter egg hunt. It's going to be for families. They're going to kind of be dismissed to go uh, hunt Easter eggs as a family group and just told, just grab 10 eggs or ish. I don't know how many eggs exactly, just a few eggs per kid. Um, and then you'll just take the eggs home with you. We're going to be doing a community care event out in the fellowship hall. Well, in Nixa, it's in the fellowship hall. Um, we're going to be having little lilies to take up and place onto a cross to decorate a cross in the front of the sanctuary. The youth are organizing that. That'll be a little bit of a fundraiser for them for the national youth gathering. In Nixa, we're going to have information about Nixa preschool for any of our families that have questions about that and might, might be coming back to church on Easter Sunday. Um, and there was one more thing. Oh, we're in, in Nixa, we're going to have a few snacks. Um, we're going to have a few prepackaged snacks for kiddos at least. So, and coffee will be available as well. So we'll be masked as much as we can be. Um, but, uh, we are, you know, we're not offering big meal. We don't have Easter breakfast. We don't want to do those types of things, but we do have quite a few things happening from nine 30 to 10 30 on Easter Sunday morning. And we're excited that we can do those things back in the sanctuary and in the building. And we're excited that you guys will join us. So if you want to, that's kind of what's, you know, it's still entirely up to you whether or not you are comfortable coming back to those festivities. There will be, I think, quite a few people there. Um, but uh, we pray that as many as are able will be joining us. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks for giving me the extra sort of time and lay of the land. Uh, if you're wondering about stream service on Easter, it will be the 8 a.m. services. We'll, both the 8 a.m. services will be the ones that will be streamed and then available, of course, after the fact, just like they always are. Whew, that was a lot. Thanks be to God. I'm glad we're getting done at least a little bit early tonight and God's peace on the rest of your evening. Have a good night, everybody. The Lord bless and keep you. Bye.